In 1973, the BBC followed a rock group living in a commune in Norfolk with their families, roadies and managers. Their aim was to be self-reliant and to make it big without a record label. We actually thought we were going to change the world. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a rock star. At home or on the road, they were determined to spread the message of Global Village Trucking Company. It's like the stars in the sky. It was a given that what we were doing was just going to get bigger and, you know, loads of other people were doing it in parallel. Success followed when they recorded sessions for the BBC's John Peel and two albums. But it all fell apart. As I recall it, it was Mike who was the first one to say, look, I'm just standing up on stage again and I just can't think what I'm doing here. There was probably a shelf life for the band, if you like. It was destined to do what it did over a period of time. What happened next revisits the original film. We, I mean, all, all the chicks here are, are faithful and all that. Finds out what became of the group's members. The issue is just going to be about the size of the deal. And joins them as they reunite for their first gig in 30 years. I don't know if there's going to be about 50 people and a dog or whether there are going to be people flowing on to Leightonstone High Road, I don't know. When five young men decide to form a pop group, they don't usually set up house in a remote cottage in the wilds of Norfolk together with all their girlfriends. But the Global Village Trucking Company aren't an ordinary pop group. They're not very worried about making money, and they won't take any of the usual shortcuts to success. What they are determined to do is to make their own way without what they regard as the moguls of the record business, the promoters, the big managers, the professional manipulators. Global Village want to do it their way. Well, we're a rock and roll band with a difference. The difference being the fact that, that we live as a community of about 15 people, all of whom in their own ways contribute to the music which comes out, even though the final product is just five musicians on stage. Our whole household is a self-contained working unit, which includes all the people who help get the show on the road, like the roadies, the managers, and then all the people behind the scenes, like back at the house doing the domestic things. And it's all like a sort of great big family and a working team all in one, all pushing towards this end product of getting the music out. Like our aims are, are to make it to, to, to get the music as good as possible and to get it out to as many people, but to enable that to, to, to support us in the way that we want to live, and that the two are very, very closely connected and in terms of what we're trying to do. When you're doing something at the time, it just seems like the natural thing to do. You know, there was this, this, this rock and roll band, there were these people who were the sort of support system to the band, there was a philosophy and a lifestyle that we all wanted to embrace, and it all kind of just happened. It wasn't sort of mapped out on graph paper, it wasn't something that was planned in any sort of, you know, organised fashion. It was just you did what you did. We get a lot of feedback into the music from the, from the place we live in, from, which you wouldn't get, like in the city, you'd get sort of speedy and neurotic music. It's a more organic thing altogether, you know, which comes out in the music, a much more relaxed atmosphere. So what, you mean so? I think it was a lot through convenience of the fact that if a band then you could live together and when you could rehearse day and night if you wanted to. But sometimes, in actual fact, the other people in the house might say, oh God, you can stop yet. 
Well, we've decided it's a lot easier to be out in the country, which is why we're living out in Norfolk. It creates a much more harmonic feel, both within ourselves and with our environment. Like, people always think in terms of the country as a place to, to go away to and do nothing. And it doesn't actually work like that with us at all, because within this small space, under this roof, there's incredible energy going on, there's incredible determination to do something which we all believe in. And um, it gets very hectic at times, like tempers get frayed and people say very heavy things to one another, but basically it's, it's, it's great. Everyone in Global Village has their own responsibility to the group. Helga's in charge of the washing. The idea is that all should work and play together in peace and harmony. Don't tread too heavily on that bit of metal, Johnny, because you'll go right through. Hey, Jimmy, do you know where the hole was? Well, look up, you can see the sky! It's all right, I can see it, yeah. Predictably, the women do most of the housework, while the men are expected to keep the place from falling apart. There's nothing revolutionary about the division of labour. Yeah, but I can't remember which bit it was. That's all right, George. Can't you see it? There's a hole. You can see the sky through it. If I cover up the hole, you will no longer be able to see it. Got it? The, the band is like a vehicle that, um, that provides a bit of momentum to keep us all together. Because if we were just a commune of people that weren't really doing anything, didn't have very sort of sharply defined aims, we, you know, the whole thing might crumble around us. You know? But because we're all going in a direction, and the band and the music and everything gives us that direction, um, we, we know it's not just going to disappear one day. Like that. Yeah, I can no longer see the sky. Great! We were prepared to try anything. What we knew, both in terms of the music and of the lifestyle, was that it, things didn't have to be the way they'd always been. You didn't have to um, live in a nuclear family situation. Uh, you could try communal living, and that was wonderful. Uh, um, I'd go back to that if it still existed. I'd love to live like that again. How much do the men help in the business of actually running the house? Well, we, uh, we have a rotation, and they're all supposed to do the separate jobs, the easy jobs, like cleaning the bathroom, which James helps Daniela do. Johnny's supposed to do the stairs, and we all have turns washing up every day, and we're supposed to keep the kitchen together on that day, do all the sweeping things. They don't... They do help a lot around the house, like they, Johnny mends the roof and he does the electricity and if we didn't have him, he did all the wiring in this house, which we'd have been lost for that. The way we derive our benefit from living together is by working together, because it helps give us a framework to operate in. See, right, we live we together have... because we love each other, and but that's not we're given a way you know? to love each other because we have to work with each other. It was the perfect blend, or could be the perfect blend of spirituality and, uh, and rock and roll. That rock and roll was the voice. It was what you did if you had something to say and something to change. I was very much a performer and a front man. Probably I got into trouble for being a front man and a performer rather than a good, actually, member of the commune. We're a commune band and we're all important because I actually quite like being a front man and entertaining. And um, you can't help that if you're the singer. Because the band are based on Norfolk, they have a strong local following. This gig in a disco under a Norwich pub attracts enthusiastic local support. You know, they're really earthy and they pull across the message of the sort of generations today. They're sort of happy go like lucky band, you know. You know, they just they create an atmosphere that everybody yeah. agrees with, you know. They, yeah. It's all classic. Out here, you know, in Norfolk, you know, you, you get you get you get put down, you know, because you're here. But they they just create a local atmosphere, don't they? Yeah. Everything. Yeah. We just we just like them because they they they're, they're not there's no hassles there's no sort of pretense.
Home life in Global Village has the casual intimacy of an unusually relaxed family. A letter from a friend is like a letter home. James has just spoken to Joe on the telephone. What about the wedding? Yeah. The wedding. And the so description of... Uh... Congratulations to Jimmy and Freddie's, his mum and Mr... And everyone else who feels they need congratulating on this auspicious etc. The house was about 13 rooms, 11 of which were, were bedrooms. There was a kitchen and a music room and a bathroom and toilet. Every other room in the house was a, a bedroom Spending. because there were so many people living there. All my love, hair and fingernails, chocolate O'Dwarf and Wendy. <laughs> I was 16, so I was quite a lot younger than most people there. We actually lived in the old coal hole. Yeah, yeah we had the coal the hole, which wasn't <laughs> full of coal, but it was... Was it? Yeah, it was a coal hole originally. Mm. Because I remember I had to shovel loads of coal out of there. Oh, lovely, before no, I be came. Before you came, yes, before I went and got oh, you. Oh, you to make <laughs> an effort clear all then, that out, absolutely. And then we moved next to the band room, which was horrific. It was a bigger nasty. bedroom. Yeah. That was the thing. Not much, but it was no, a bigger bedroom. But they played all night, and it was really, really noisy in there. The most annoying was Simon drumming. Yeah, that was Because he, he would yeah. practice, and Simon was, was just, just drumming annoying, on his own, yeah. exactly. And he was just going through his, his rhythms, his doing his yeah. various rhythms all the time, his practicing, which did get annoying. Mike, we should be Ken Moore, we should be able to go to the group find great strength in self-reliance, not just emotionally, but right down to the most simple domestic tasks, like making their own bread. Because our, our society's got so big, um, there's this great sense of impersonality, you know. You don't really feel like, like you're very close to someone, and if you're living with people all the time, you're very close to them all the time, um, you, never, you never sort of feel this insecurity. Um, and a lot of people have this idea that people live in communes, they're, they're wild, degenerate hippies, you know, and they think, <coughs> I think they think they're not quite like human beings, you know. And I mean, every human being has this thing in them that um, eventually, you know, part of their search for themselves and for a bit of security is, is pairing up with one person. I got away from my family at that time. Um, I was still quite young myself, I'd left home. Uh, I was still in touch with my family, but I felt... I felt a need to break out of um, a very comfortable suburban existence at that time um, and uh, discover some new things in the world. Um, and when you're in that phase of your life, you need to get away from your own family sometimes. Um, but you still need some support from people, so it's marvellous to find um, people who would who would take over that role the sort of stock image of the of the commune the one that we're all familiar with is uh, this sort of scene of depravity and everybody sleeping with everybody else and sort of thing i mean how in fact does it work out well we, i mean all the, all the chicks here are, are faithful and all that i mean you know we all sort of all the chicks never sleep with anyone else as far as i know well i don't anyway and um all the all the unattached ones usually have chicks home from gigs or something. Not not very often though. Friends, you, know, you know, they're, they're usually not. friends. They're, I mean, they're not sort of they're not sort of sordid or anything like that. They're really good friends who they happen to dig each other a lot and love each other. Not necessarily in the sort of the way you love your wife or you love your girlfriend, but in the friends love way, and that they think it's a nice thing to do. You know, it's really nice. Vicky, do you think as a mother with a child? that living with this community adds something there? Oh yes, yes. Because, because well, we've got brothers and sisters and, and he's got mothers and fathers besides myself. And, and as he hasn't got an established father, he's, he's can learn so much more from several just different fathers and mothers. At that time it just felt how it should be. It just, there wasn't any question as far as I was concerned that that is how um, certainly I should live. I, I wasn't sure about the rest of the world, but it seemed such a good way for people to live and, and to share everything, to share everything. And we all love him just mm. the same. Yeah. You know? I, mean, I, I really love him. I mean, he's not my, my baby, really. I mean, not by sort of medical terms, but I mean I feel just as much, well not as much as a mother as Vicky does, but and I feel very maternal towards him, you know, because he's, he's, a, he's a child in our community.
one of the things about being a community that is also a rock and roll band is that you have to go out and do gigs. Um, it suits us to have a large bus because that way we can take the family with us. And so when we go off to a gig, the roadies load up the gear, and then everybody piles onto the bus, and we've got a hardcore audience, if you like, of people who, who are going to groove on the music already there with us to help us get the atmosphere going. Global Village sometimes go out on gigs where they know they won't get paid. They've even played at Norwich Prison for free. And they sometimes tunnel their old bus across the country to turn up at a street festival or an open-air party just for the fun of it. But to keep the family together, they have to make money somehow. And to do that, they have to travel to where the work is. For them, as for most groups, trucking around the country is a large part of their whole way of life. But because they're all together, they try to make even the most boring aspects of life enjoyable. Travelling becomes a party. You know, this is the time of Ted Heath, the miners strike, the three day week. So we were actually living through a quite a, a political time in this country. It was when there was a lot of IRA activity and we were cruising through that and I think in some ways we maybe tried to pretend we weren't a part of that. The music is just a means of putting out to the public what we are experiencing and living as a community in the country. We're like bringing a bit of the country to the places in the city that we play, like sort of when we go to Soho. Like those people just don't know what a space is, you know, they're all the time like hemmed in, in, in inside skyscrapers and cars and stuff like that. And like if the music can portray a bit of a, of a different scene, maybe in a, a, the other side of, of how they're living. You know, that's, that's really nice, that's really far out for those people if they can't get that any other way. Why don't you just leave all your minor problems to professional management rather than trying to work it out yourselves? We'd never have any control over our own situations. Yeah. And we've got so many people around to, to, to handle things and take decisions on things. It's pretty important to, to use them. See, I think it's that, that much more satisfaction, you know, like when you, when you get all those little things which kind of really bug most people, when you get them all sussed out. Um, as a group, you know, you just get more satisfaction when it actually all comes together when you're doing it all, when you're doing something. Yeah, it's a great satisfaction seeing a, a, an idea flow through a lot of people and gradually yeah, right. materialise into something concrete, you know, that everybody susses out and then takes part in. There's a whole fund of knowledge going up because people like us are getting it on themselves, you know, the whole, the whole earth catalogue type of attitude and gathering data and doing it yourself and learning by doing it. The world was going mad in 1973. Everybody, you know, we'd, we'd, I'd been demonstrating against Vietnam War in Australia and then people were burning their draft cards and running away and changing their way of life and people were not going to 
become businessmen and people were not going to go and work for a firm and people were you were always going to work for yourself for truth and beauty what is it that happened to a lot of people's consciousness which makes them no longer prepared to, you know to, to go the way that you all could have gone I mean, you could be living comfortably, and instead, yeah. you live in, you know, a, a drafty, wet, dingy yeah, cottage coffee. in the middle of a blasted heat right. in Norfolk. It's natural, it's not I think it's the most comfortable place I've ever been. Yeah, yeah. I, really I feel spiritually it's more comfortable than, than... Yeah, you can. The comfort depends on, depends on exteriors, like central heating and stuff like that. Comfort doesn't depend on that at all. Because you create comfort wherever you are and whatever you're doing. You, you wish to be comfortable, so you create that comfort. Yeah. But previously, everybody's been educated by, by <laughs> concerns whose survival depends on the amount of product they can sell. People are, are taught to believe that comfort depends on how many products you have, how much you consume. But a whole load of people brought up comfortable middle-class backgrounds going through the traumas of adolescence suddenly realize that they're not comfortable in that situation. And we're suddenly discovering that comfort isn't dependent on how much money you make and how much you spend, but how you feel. Most of the members of Global Village aren't much given to deep philosophizing about their way of life. But they probably all believe that they're reaching back to a feeling for the vital relationship between man and nature, a feeling which they believe is growing in the world. There were magical moments there, but a lot of them might have been inspired by LSD. I, I can't remember well, but I remember that we used to run around occasionally naked in the fields, which was very enjoyable, I seem to remember. But I remember Vicky's parents turning up once when I was wandering around naked. They were a bit shocked. They drove up in their car. I seem to remember that. This feeling is something that has always been around. And if one loses, sort of touch with that flow of life, then one ends up in a very sort of sterile situation, which I think, you know, a lot of people are to, uh, find themselves today. So what does Global Village do to redress the balance? Well, <laughs> we're just one of a lot of people who have sort of felt something about a sort of a new sort of vibration or atmosphere in the air, you know, that's affecting everyone, really. And could you so, put that into words, what that is? A feeling, those I suppose aims. it's a, it's a, it's more a memory or, a, or a, a flash of something that could, could, really happen. You know, that this world could be a better place, and can be a better place. Like if everyone gets down and, and tries to put something which is a, only a dream into reality. May Day in Oxford, a festival for Global Village. This is May the first, and it's the first day of summer and therefore it's a, a, an occasion for a bit of celebration, a bit of dancing and singing and getting out in the streets and getting it on generally and perhaps a little sense of ritual as well. The fact that summer's coming is still a, a thing to dance and sing about. Once upon a time Everybody joined in this celebration. It's a very traditional thing. In those days, I guess it would have been a medieval fair. Today, when you want to do that, with a lot of young people around, you have a rock festival. Last year, it was the start of the band as well. It was one of the first gigs the band ever did. And we came to be so closely associated with the beginning of summer in Oxford that we've got it on again this year. Okay, I give you Global Village Trucking Company, all yours. They know they may not stay together forever, but for them it's now that counts. The music is the message. 
If we can understand it, we can begin to understand what they're on about. There was probably a shelf life for the band, if you like. It was destined to do what it did over a period of time and then it probably didn't have the right internal dynamics to, 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 to survive a successful commercial career. As I recall it, it was Mike who was the first one to say, look, I'm just standing up on stage again and I just can't think what I'm doing here. I was going through a phase where I was definitely losing confidence about the playing and I wasn't enjoying it and I was getting, I think I was getting a bit of stage fright or something. And I found that actually being on the road I wasn't actually enjoying it that much and the reason I wasn't enjoying it was because we were going up and down the M1 and going to Birmingham, going to Aberdeen and going to Lancashire and, and these were boring places as far as I was concerned. And I was now like 25 and I thought, I want to see the world, you know. And I thought, well maybe this band will see the world. I um, talked to a couple of musicians and asked them uh, what's America like because I was obviously quite interested in I'd never been abroad really apart from farm and the guy said oh, well I don't know I'll tell you what the Holiday Inn's like and at that moment I, I knew we were in a bubble already but I didn't want to go around the world in a bubble and um, left the band A bit of the heart went out of it when Michael left and went to Brazil. I think I got more into sort of a hedonistic situation really to be quite honest um, and you know this spiritual search I think was kind of like put on hold because I was actually having quite an intense time playing and, and grooving and, and, and doing all the things that you might want to do when you're a young guy in Brazil. You know after about three or four years I suddenly felt a bit empty headed and I suddenly started to want to know more again about how you tick. Not necessarily from a spiritual point of view, more from a, just how it works. So I decided to read up on neurophysiology at that time. I know it sounds crazy. But I was, so, I, and I realised that I couldn't actually read those books without knowing about some basic chemistry, biochemistry, blah, blah, blah. So I started, went through this whole study of all these things, you know, from atoms up to, you know, biochemistry, enough to be able to read these books. And uh, this was all about consciousness and what newer physiologists thought about consciousness. And that had a lot of influence on me and I started reading these books. And that's where holography was mentioned. And I started to get really interested in this idea about holography. Basically, I have to have an obsession or I just sort of want to die. So basically, I had to combine whatever small talents I've got in art or science or whatever and combine it into a synthesis that is what holography demands. So it's um, something that has kept me, if you like, getting up in the morning, really. I'm using this very old computer here, which is really good for the job. 
but we we'll have to wait for it to warm up a bit. So they got a long one. Yeah, and then you can just use the shutter like that. Right. Here you can see the laser beams going around these optics here. And um, because we're doing animated holograms, which isn't the only kind of holograms we do, but you can see the film projector here. It projects onto the screen and it projects sequential frames onto that screen, which is then recorded by the hologram as sequential frames which it stores. So that you see sequential frames as you walk past the hologram. Do you think it's going to work? Uh, yes, I think it, I think it does, yeah. I mean, well, you've got to stand right back though, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, but there's a yeah. lot of stuff well, if going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, well, it's a huge animation, isn't it? The more that you know about lots of things, the more that you can do holography, and therefore you don't get one bit of the brain. It's not like doing IT or computers where just one bit of the brain is, you know. Um, that's why I like it. And also because I can drift off and imagine, you know, the consequences of what holography is about in terms of cos cosmology and everything else. So that's why I find it quite a complete sort of um, area for me. Read all about it. Read all about it while you can. Oh, SN58. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be about 50 people and a dog or whether there are going to be people flowing on to Leightonstone High Road, I don't know, because uh, we, we haven't the faintest idea. I'm just concerned to make sure that um, we kind of play okay. We've only had one rehearsal. Simon, how are you feeling about this gig? I thought I'd ask a question for you. I'm feeling numb. He's getting lagging. He's comfortably numb. Comfortably numb. I'm James, come back. How are you doing, all right? Thanks. Yeah. Oh God, watch out, he starts smoothing. Thanks for giving us... <laughs> no, but thanks for giving us a gig at such yeah, short yeah, notice, yeah, man. It's not, it, that's not easy. Right. Have we already done all that? Few weeks. Yeah, well, I have not. I haven't done it. Have I? We well, don't even know who you are. Good evening, but you're the organist, by the way. Oh, okay, cool. Organist, is that what you call me? Is that what I am to you, an organist? Bloody hell, after all these years. That's what I get, an organist. There isn't even, even such a word. Create comfort wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You you wish to be comfortable, so you create that comfort. People are, are taught to believe that comfort depends on how many products you have, how much you consume. This one. That one. Yeah, that'll do. The, that one or the other one. That one is better. Lift that up a second. Under there. Well, in a sense, it looks like I'm the only one left out of the original group who's still living communally. This place is similar, and it's a school. And everybody here is a student of the school. Staff, principal, gardeners, everybody is a student of the school. Everybody works towards a single aim. And so I see it as a logical continuation of why we were all living together, why we had to band, what we were trying to express, what we were trying to do. And this is it. We're going to study flash number six. It starts in in like manner. Okay. 
ready? Well, says the Malavia or Rum, may God sanctify his secret, in the Masnavi. If thy thought be a rose, thou art a rose bouquet. If it be a thorn, thou art fuel for the fire. Bashara School of Intensive Esoteric Education. Now, that's a, that's a kind of a huge thing to talk about, but essentially education is about drawing out what's inside of each person, and that's what the place is for here. Existence is one, and everything participates in that according to itself, and one is informed about reality by reality itself. The school exists to help people to understand how to listen and look and watch the reality unfolding itself in front of them. My whole life is a search for truth and the Global Village Trucking Company was a very, very important step on the way. Just because that shape and frame that was the Global Village Trucking Company has fallen away, it doesn't mean to say the search for truth stops. You keep walking, you carry on. I've got here and uh, I don't have to do anything at all because normally I used to set up Simon's drums. He used to have them stoned roadie proof so I could set them up in whatever condition I was in and I could just set the whole drum kit up and he would come in and adjust the snare drum if we were lucky and that was it. Brilliant. Looks excellent. But yeah, no, I've timed it to perfection. Congratulations to Jimmy and Freddie's, his mum and everyone else who feels they need congratulating on this auspicious etc. All my love, hair and fingernails, Chocolate O Dwarf and Wendy. But when you look at that, yeah. you look how young we were. Especially me, I was 16. How Mom, many Mummy was 16 and I was 21. How old were you? 21. I was 21. I mean, it's rare, isn't oh. it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're the only ones out of everybody who's still together. Oh, that is yeah. yeah, I mean, I was super young, you know. But I'd also been a bit of a wild kid, so not bad, not bad. Right? Thing, but I'd, lived quite I'd lived a quite theory. a life. I think I'm quite proud of them really. Um, it seemed very exciting. I'm quite impressed that my mum was probably the first person naked on television. Yes. Like <laughs> first naked person on television, that, that's probably pretty impressive. At least in this country. As long as no one much sees it. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. She's yes. proud of me. I, mean, I wouldn't do it now, I can assure you. But, <laughs> But I know my grandmother completely disowned me because I was naked in the bath. <laughs> naked in the bath. With a hippie. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was actually quite, you know, for my family, my parents were okay about it to my memory, I can't really remember. But my grandmother wouldn't speak to me for years. Well, I think it's seriously embarrassing, some of it, I must say. I'm more embarrassed about what I said than what I looked like. I think... I think you feel so affected the way that I was sort of saying chick and dig and things like that. But that's the time. That's the way it's the it's the it's the yeah. And it's like the way people talk now. You'd all die of embarrassment if they, um, if you knew how you behaved when you were a teenager. Or people saying latents and skank and whatever. That, in it, rude boy. In it, rude boy. Yeah. yeah. That's not gonna. It doesn't travel well over the years. But my rosy picture and memory of it was that we lived in this idyllic, beautiful cottage in a beautiful, beautiful place. And it looks horrible. It, I mean, the kitchen looks so manky. I mean, it was really... And it everyone just, was lovely and we all looked beautiful. I thought I looked beautiful. I never brushed my hair. I mean, I just... I think you did look beautiful. 
I think the time we were there was such an important moment in time, but also we met each other and loved each other and, and we it fell, was all, in, love fell in love and we're still together. Absolutely. But I do think that the time was, of, it was it, morally, it was a very good time. I really do believe that it moulded me to some extent. Yeah, and what, and what we learned there from the commune, living together, living with other people, yeah, interacting, and we I, shared everything. Yeah, and I, I think we... It was very fair. I think we are hippies. We'll always be hippies. I mean, a hippie is Yeah, a hippie. it's in my heart. It Absolutely. totally is. You know, we, we live in quite a communal way now, even though we don't oh, have yes, anyone yes. living with us. But if you think of the fact that the kids are still living at home, and they bring their friends and around their friends, as well, so that yeah, it's always been a, a very busy house yeah. and there's always lots of people coming yeah. in and out. I think we always had the coolest parents around. Um, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there was elements to which we felt a bit, I felt a bit straight-laced in comparison, the, the Safi to the Adina, as you kind of said, um, what with the getting good education and all that kind of stuff. But then again, I think that was very encouraged as well, so I didn't feel like... There wasn't many ways to rebel, let's put it that way, but um, mm -hmm. there wasn't really much need to either, because we could pretty much do whatever we like. Lives like a repetitious balloon. Let me explain, you see, I entertain. I'm a ready made baboon, and it's laughter, singing, music all the way. And I'm gonna be dancing on the judgment day. A bit more bass, if anything. Can he, yeah, yeah, I think so. Like our aims are, are to make it, to, to, to get the music as good as possible and to get it out to as many people, but to enable that to, to, to support us in the way that we want to live and that the two are very, very closely connected. Right. Cheers, bye. Global Village was the starting point pretty much of my adult life and by sort of accident my working life I've been fortunate enough to continue working in and earning a living out of music which is you know was one of my great passions as a kid so that's you know I'm one of the lucky ones in that in that respect and I've been doing that for 30 basically since that program 35 years or more working in the music world I think from the conversations I've had with her, the issue is just going to be about the size of the deal, you know, and whether... Right. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of the thoughts that I had then, I still have, you know, I think that there's... Uh, you know, that there, there's times when the business side of the music business has actually helped and assisted artists in times that it's absolutely hindered and, and negatively affected them. Um, you know, I know which side of the line I've always tried to stay on, um, th and I don't think that needs to be affected by where you actually find yourself in terms of, of you know, what, what job you may have at any particular moment. You still can stay true to your ideals. Our whole household is a self-contained working unit which includes all the people who help get the show on the road, like the roadies, the managers, and then all the people behind the scenes, like back at the house doing the domestic things. And it's all like a sort of great big family and a working team all in one. 
what we were talking about in the film wasn't actually really in truth a, a, a reality we could have lived I don't think you could have sustained that band over a long period of time without engaging with a record company a record was what was going to spread the word you know and the international distribution of the record was what was going to spread the word quickest and most effectively now that thanks mainly to technology bands are able in a way that they haven't been for the last 25 years or so to, to be a lot more self-sufficient that self-determined through you know the, the the online world being able to, to to build an audience online without having to to um, engage with a big corporation I think you're going to see that situation growing more and more as as, as we look forward to, to to the old kind of record company dominated music scene starting to crumble and and it will start to reinvent itself whilst you're in the middle of it no one quite knows which way to look some people are scared by it some people are excited by the possibilities it throws up I think I'm in the latter camp of those two now if this this country or this world ever reaches a point of some kind of crisis and everybody's very it, right in the back of their minds we never talk about it but everybody's thinking this may happen one day even if we don't have anything else we got each other you know? at the time I thought of myself as being not particularly good-looking but very very clever and then looking back at the film uh, I had the opposite impression. I thought, oh, I was better looking than I realised at the time, but so stupid. Hopefully wiser now. I would have liked for the band to have made it to um, a more successful recording career because that was always what I was trying to do for them and I was frustrated in what I was trying to do because every time I get them a potential record deal they would turn it down on the basis that they didn't want to sell out to the industry that had a very bad name at that time for exploiting musicians. You could say that uh, that was their undoing because they would never take a record deal. I suppose it is ironic that I'm still trucking after all these years. I always enjoyed the travelling aspect of it and that's really why I do this job now. I did various different things for a while but ended up getting my HGV licence and driving a truck um, and then going on tour with various bands. I've worked for uh, lots of famous people, Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan, David Bowie, all sorts of people like that. I never had such a good experience as that though because um, there was something special about those times. Nothing ever quite matched it. If you're on tour with a band, it's the best job in the world because you've got your own little home with you all the time. The others are in and out of uh, hotel rooms and aeroplanes and sleeping on buses all crammed together. Um, and I have my own four-star luxury suite and I can just draw the curtains at the end of the day when it's all been too much um, and I'm in the same place every night. corners of the globe, bringing you their unique brand of retro cutting edge. Woo! I give you Woo! Global Village Trucking Company. Hey! Look into the night, you can see a star. Look into the night. 
You can see how far away it is Look into the day You can see the sun Look into the day You can see anyone that you want to Look into my eyes Face. I keep it with me all the time Look into my heart and I will find yourself I can't seem to leave your memory behind Even though I keep on trying I can't seem to leave your memory behind Oh no, no, no I can't seem to leave your memory the truth is, I mean, honestly, it, it, it sounds facetious again, but there's a lot of people you ask, and they would say, John Owen should have, been a, should have been a rock and roll star, except A, he didn't like going out at night, and B, never remembered the words. It wasn't really important to me to be famous. It was, it was a very important thing to me to be able to make a living out of music which was worthwhile and had integrity. What was more important to me when I, when I was working with the, with, the, with, the, with the Globs, if you like, was actually the people I met on the road. The people I met at Boxmoor Hall, those guys from Norwich, and the people, I'm really interested in people and what they've got to say. That's led on to what I do now in the fact that I work with lots of different people. I work with small babies, I work with pensioners, I work with young, shall we say, young people, disadvantaged. I, you know, I've, spent, I've made a career out of using music uh, with marginalised groups of people. I was eight when I came here. I had to say goodbye to George. I came here with my brother. I said, where's he going? They said, if you want to see him, you can. When people ask me what I do for a living now, I say, I hang around people and see what happens. I'm a professional musician and composer and what I call an artistic advocate in the fact that I use my, my skills in order to actually uh, get what other people want to say out to other people who want to hear it. I was eight when I came here. I had to say goodbye to George. I came here with my brother. I became more of a, a conduit for other people's ideas and I like it. It's like musical documentary. I had to say goodbye to George. I came here with my brother. Having said that, don't say there's not a selfish motive in it, because I'm also working with other people, and my creativity actually comes from them as well. And the people say, well, don't you want to do something for yourself, John? Don't you want to do, because do, I don't really write many songs anymore, unless somebody asks me to. But I say, but this has become so much ingrained that my art, my, my composition, my music, is that. I here with my brother. I said, where's he going? Over in the boys. I do it because uh, I really enjoy it. And it's what I do, and I get a real buzz out of it. In some ways, actually, a substitute for me for being a performer. When a friend you've had a long time isn't happy, you have reason to believe that. You're to blame Do you shrug your shoulders Much as said I be How can 
Clubs play. The club is, it's not just playing. It's like a family. It's like you have the bloody deadheads. Well, these are the globheads, whatever you want to call them. It's like a family. Everybody needs a good friend sometimes. Yes, and sometimes in the life. There's a lot of people here. I mean, it's a long time ago. Who this means. An incredible amount of it, because it was, a, it was like a, a moment, a few years in time, where it was really profound on a lot of people. But together we could make a brand new start. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. You have to encourage them to do it again, but not wait 35 years for the next one because I'll be dead then. No, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. One more time for everybody, he could say. He could maybe.